I want to welcome you all to the February luncheon hour. We're going to be talking about IT security strategies for the small medium business. Uh, and we're gonna, we've got a lot of stuff to cover. So, uh, plagiarism is really cool. I mean, being inspired by other sources is really cool. Uh, I want to stress here, we are a partner with Sophos. Sophos is a security company which primarily is known probably best uh, for their um, antivirus, but they've got a lot of other tools. And I actually was down at a partner briefing um, actually, I was at a, their partner conference last year in Vegas, and then at Columbus they had a regional briefing uh, just a few weeks ago. I lifted a lot of stuff from that. Um, so we're going to go with that, and then we've got some other additions from CompTIA. First of all, data. That's one of the core needs when we start talking about protecting. We want to protect data, whatever that means. Yeah, you have structured data, which would be your customer database, the application-driven data, all that kind of fun stuff. You can see from this slide, yes, I actually have information in this presentation. It does not happen often, okay? Or, or it's completely fictitious, one or the other. But as you can see, the trend is ridiculous, and especially when you look at unstructured data, the amount of exabytes so we are looking at ridiculous data growths, which is both opportunity in terms of the usefulness of this information, as well as opportunity to someone who wants to exploit the vulnerability of the data. Because it's, the data at rest is just storage. That's a hard drive that has data on it. But when the data goes into use, whether it be appropriately or inappropriately, this is where we have to be concerned. And especially when you take a look at the amount of data that's now cloud-driven or cloud-based or hybrid, meaning some of it's local and some of it's external, as well as the equal amount of proliferation in terms of who's accessing and using the data, this is getting ridiculous. Okay? It's all over the bloody place. You know, if you think of, do we have any, is there anything, anything that would be a similar metaphor? Yeah, disease. Because if you think about it back a couple hundred years ago, you actually, and there's, there's been some studies done on this, uh, as, as transportation methods improved, so too did the spread of diseases. And I actually know a guy who did his master's paper on how smallpox uh, was, the spread of smallpox was dependent upon the horses. Because that's how people moved. So the same thing here, as we have more and more parties, it used to be corporate data was held by the corporation, by the organization. Now the corporate data, the corp it may be still the corporation, but the corporation is now dispersed because we have both multiple locations that are all by the same corporation, as well as employees who are now accessing the data on the road. Those people on the road are also accessing data from other parties on the same devices. Okay, and we also have the corporations, their vendors are both adding and removing data or manipulating data both ways as well as the customers. So not only you can look at this as a strictly static number of how much data is being used, but you also have the proliferation of the access of data is equally there. And structured data is easy to protect because structured data like a SQL database, you got to get in this way, you got to get the data out this way. Unstructured data, documents, all that kind of fun stuff. Significantly different game. Now I'm going to go steal, borrow Sophos's slides and their presentations. And, and this kind of drives home. So I've got email. I've got mobile devices, phones and the like. I've got your traditional laptop, desktop. I've got people who are accessing it through remote connectivity. People who are using the USB drives and then web driven, whether it be applications or the like. Every one of these represents a method by which data from party A is now going to be used or manipulated or whatever by devices over on B and vice versa. So what do you have? We have a company, you know, your corporate data, intellectual property, bank account, yada, yada, yada. All of this stuff. And this amount of information was never on these things just a couple of years ago. These devices never had to worry about that. It wasn't until about two or three years ago that actual financial or application information was on mobile devices. 
one of the one of the things that we also hear we don't hear it as much as we used to but even a year or two ago we're too small no one would want to come after our data well the problem is is that they've made it more efficient it's no longer a someone has to actually work at hacking you it's automated so when you take a look and this is just a couple of examples it's automated coordinated and professional because they're making money off of it just a couple of years ago, there really wasn't all that much money to be made in hacking unless you had to work at getting rid and selling the data. But now, it's very, especially when you start taking a look at ransomware and the like. So there's an incentive for the bad guys above and beyond. <laughs> we just wanted to hack and see if we could. Now, they're actually making money. So we've created a situation where their, their incentive, they've give, they're, they're given incentives to go after the small guys. Why not? It's just one more distribution. Instead of sending out 100 emails, send out 101. Put out this infected website. If it's a small guy who gets it, eh, no problem. If it's a large guy, company-wise, all the better. Now, and this is, this is one of those things where, yeah, not for large enterprises and governments, and, and, and a lot of you have already heard my, before we get too high and mighty about, oh, those bad companies that are doing these horrible things, take a look at what's installed on your phone. The odds are, if you've installed apps, you've got malware on your phone. All right? Because when these people come out with these applications that are free, and again, the flashlight being my favorite, mm -hmm. you know, when you install an application that's a flashlight, and it comes up and says, hey, in order to be a flashlight, as I keep saying flashlight, I need access to all of your information. I need access to your passwords. I need access to your contacts. I need access to your traffic. I need... No, they don't. But you still have literally millions, and in some cases, tens of millions of people who say, that's okay, give it to them. And then get upset because Target got hacked. You know? But here's the problem, is that companies are allowing these people, which probably includes us, to access the corporate data using those exact same devices. So it's, it's an issue. Whatever company we talk about, and I'm, we're obviously we're talking Sophos, but we could probably say the same thing, Trend Micro, Symantec, Kaprisky, any of those guys. All of them are constantly taking a look at files because files have attributes, and we'll talk about that a little bit, but of files that they say, oh, we now have to protect against that type of file. We're now at the point where they see 450,000 new files in their methods, and they literally go out and try to find these things. And every day they're seeing 300, 450,000 files, new ones. Why is that? Partially because the bad guys are trying to be more clever, too. So you've got this constant thing that's going on between both organizations. Similarly, 20 to 30,000 malicious URLs, websites, web pages, every day. Okay, really? Because remember, what in cases, what a lot of them will do is they'll actually put this ad onto this otherwise healthy site because the healthy site actually isn't directly controlling those. It's subcontracting. It's basically selling that space to a third party who may be selling it to a subsequent third party. Each party is not necessarily as cautious or careful as the next guy. And if anybody clicks on any of those, boom, we take advantage, or the bad guys then take advantage of some of the vulnerabilities. This is where one of the key things is when you start talking about Java or Flash especially, there's a lot of vulnerabilities. Why? Because those are programs that are supposed to make these websites do cool things on your workstation. Well, that cool thing could involve also compromising and destroying your data and bringing it into civilization as we know it, which really can be cool if it's done right with the high-level special effects and 3D glasses. <laughs> we talk about, and, and malware is starting to become the catch-all, and here's one of the questions, or one of the issues, is right now when you take a look at your general attack, or a risk that is on your company's computer, only about 30% of them are, are now viruses. 
only about 30%. So when you sit back and you say, okay, we got antivirus, we're covered. No, you're covered for these guys. You're not necessarily covered for these guys. You're not necessarily covered for the websites that have vulnerabilities that are taking advantage. Okay, and that's even it, that's assuming that the antivirus is up to date and is protecting you against the latest viruses. You also have that issue as well. So we've also got, you know, a collection of infected systems. So we're going to infect a whole bunch of systems and they're going to go do stuff for the bad guy. Man in the browser, the stuff that actually there's, you know, th the browser ends up being the infected party through websites and the like. Malware that installs other malware. This is one of our favorites. <coughs> ransomware. Here's the thing about ransomware. No one's beaten it. Okay? Ransomware, what ransomware will do, and this is important to understand kind of the sequence of events here, if we get into it a little bit later, is ransomware, someone installs a piece of software on their system for the best of intentions, hopefully. That software will then go out and request from one of the bad guy's servers an encryption key. It will receive that key and will then go and encrypt all of the data files, Word, Excel, all the documents, none of the operating system, none of the programs, all that stuff works fine, but all your data it will encrypt that that user has access to and you're done. Until it then will, anytime you look at any of the stuff, you will not be able to open it, you will have to get a key or you'll have to go to your backups. No one has figured out a way to decrypt this stuff yet. Okay? Now, a lot of the antivirus stuff will actually, when that file starts to be installed, will recognize that and protect you. But there's a new type of virus that's been discovered within the past month. It doesn't create a file. It's in memory only. So what ends up happening is, when this is, I think it's usually through websites at this point, but it essentially just starts the program running in memory, which means your antivirus is not going to protect you because it never hits the file. It never hits the file level, which most antivirus at this point is doing file level uh, tracking, and will then go and do encryption. Well, encryption isn't an infection. Encryption is sometimes what you want to do for security's sake. Just to give you an idea, so we've got 150,000, 300,000 files, 600 million are doing lookups, 5 million spams. So one of the things that antivirus stuff does is it looks at the attributes of whatever the file or the program is, tries to identify it, and there's actually 19 identif identities account for 50% of detections, so there's, there's families of these hits or attacks, if you will. It is so easy and this is spam, links, uh, attachments, bots and zombies, and this didn't replicate from my laptop because I fixed this right before I left. We still have issues of people getting emails that look really legitimate and people click on the link. <laughs> and part of the challenge is as long as someone is going to the link, we've already lost round one because someone is actually inv inviting the technology to, hey, take your shot. We'll see if, we're, if you're good enough. We've got also by the malware, this is critical. If you don't have, if your stuff is not updated, and by that I'm talking about really Java and Flash, Flash is the biggie, but any of these guys, if they're not updated or disabled, I don't care what program you're running, you're in trouble or you're potentially in trouble, okay? And there are services, whether it be on a corporate level or an individual level, we use Ninite, that will guarantee and push and in the sense of corporate, we can take a look, we'll, verify, we'll basically keep you up to date with the legitimate updates because in some cases, yeah. the vulnerabilities show up as an update. Yeah. We're going to update your flash and destroy your world as you know it. This is the forgotten child, the mobile devices, especially for companies that don't have policies and have applications where on the mobile device you actually can access the corporate data. Okay, and part of the challenge is, is that these guys are getting more and more powerful, can do more and more, which has just as much of an addition for the bad guys as it does for the good guys. Similarly, we are attaching to networks who knows where. 
And a lot of us, the first thing we do is we look for a free, unlocked, unsecure wireless. And part of the challenge is, is that if you remember the wireless connection, your device is going to connect to that wireless again when it sees that wireless of the same name. It doesn't have to be the same network. So if someone goes ahead and creates a little uh, hotspot that's called the same as whatever ATT Wi-Fi is at McDonald's, you're going to connect to their Wi-Fi just by walking nearby. And they can then track, do a packet sniffer, and they can actually see all the data that you're transmitting, good, bad, or indifferent. And you have a lot of people who are like, oh, thank God, because I didn't want to download something because my data plan, I might end up spending 45 cents. So instead, I'm going to connect, and we'll do it. Similarly, at the, at, at the exact same time, you've got the restaurant who wants their customers to be happy, and the only way their customers are going to be happy is if, if they have easy Wi-Fi. What's the easiest way to offer Wi-Fi to your customers? Make it free and unsecure. Because otherwise, oh, yeah, the passcode didn't work because that's an uppercase H. So you've got that ease of use dilemma and, you know, economy dilemma going on between and that and the security dilemma, and nobody's talking, or until recently, we're not really talking a lot about the security dilemma as far as the mobile devices go. Two or three years ago, no big deal. Eh, it's kind of a big deal now, and it's getting bigger. Especially if you look at all of, you know, how many people are doing impulse buying on these things? But that's okay, I've got my credit card stored. You know, the credit card that's stored on the device that I just gave my flashlight access to. Wow. Okay. And again, we can make fun about the users, even though that's probably a majority of us here. But the company is allowing, allowing that user to access their data using this. Eek. Here's where we start talking about strategy. And this is a general one. Reduce the attack surface. How many ways are there to get in? If we limit the amount of methods or the amount of, tech, of devices, if we make it so that only certain you know, devices can get in through certain ways to do certain things, block the vectors of attack. So we're actually taking care of updating things such as you know, the flash and things, you know, the tools and technologies. Detect it and block it, absolutely. But here's something that I think is actually going to be, and I first heard this strategy about six months, and I'll be honest, I missed it entirely. But it got driven home to me again last week. Accept the fact you're going to lose. You're not going to be able to block all of the malware from a corporate standpoint. You're not going to be able to, but what you can do is you can minimize the impact. So to give you an example, one of the things that's going to be happening uh, on the Sophos world over the next few months is that not only is it going to be blocking files and all of that kind of, it's also going to be blocking on the laptop or the or desktop, it's also going to be blocking the data that goes out. So if it goes out, remember I was talking about getting that key, that encryption key? If it sees traffic going from any workstation or laptop to any of those suspected sites, it will block the traffic and immediately shut down the access for that machine. So in other words, this machine is infected. This machine has got malware installed on it, and it's running, whether it's memory or installed, whatever. But we've mitigated. We've basically minimized the amount of data that, and the amount of damage that it can actually do. So what we're going to be seeing, and, and by the way, the other guys are going to come out with it too. It's not just a Sophos thing. So what we're going to see is we're going to see more analysis and post-infection identification and then containment. That's new. Uh, no, I, I first heard this back in uh, June of last year when I was at the, the National Partner Conference because that's, that's, Sophos is going through a complete reorganization, uh, which we're, I'm, I'm pretty pumped about. Um, they announced it in June. The first pieces are starting to come out where they're starting to look at that from a, from a strategy, a strategic standpoint. Well, how is that different from firewall? Because this is based on behavior. If you see, and this is also on the desktop, it's on the device. 
It's not on the firewall. So what's going to happen is this will also be not just a this packet is going here at this time. This is also going to go what's in the packet, what type of packets. It's going to be much more dynamic. Uh, so if you see a combination of traffic. So you're, you're right from the standpoint of um, at the end of the day, one piece of it is going to be similar. But it's going, it's going to be a, a, a further reaching, if you will. And it's going to be much more based on the overall behavior of the device and less on the, this is just looking at one specific piece of traffic, which is more where your firewall is. So, and this, is, and it, this has actually been one of the things that I've been trying to get my head around, is security is no longer the sum of the individual pieces, which I would consider firewall an individual piece. It's now the whole collection and the behavior thereof. Also, a firewall doesn't do any good if the laptop's over at Starbucks. Right. So you've got some of the built-in that's going onto the device as well. This is a bunch of, and if anybody's interested in this, you know, um, this will be up on YouTube. It'll have all that uh, as well as just let me know. Um, this is one of the biggest challenges when we talk to companies about security. First of all, you know, there's the, we've been using this to protect us against tigers. It obviously works. I don't see any tigers. You know, and, and there are some companies who have that mentality uh, as far as going beyond, we have antivirus and we haven't lost any data yet, uh, you know, which is great, but, and the problem is, is when you take a look at implementing security, uh, implementing security, there is no return on investment that's measurable, okay, for most companies. So you cannot say that uh, we made this investment and therefore our profits are, are increased. No, we've made this investment and in theory, our risk is so much, is much smaller. Okay, well how much did you pay for the fire alarm? How much did you pay for security systems? How much did you pay for the locks on the door? So on and so forth. It's tough sometimes for companies to get into those conversations, especially if they think they're talking to a vendor who's just trying to sign them up for more services. So, but here's one, one of the, the things, so we want to mitigate the security risk, but we also in some cases accept more security risk. So usually, and this is kind of a, kind of a curious, and it almost has to do with human nature as anything else, by and large the less secure we are, the more productive we are because we don't have to go through the hoops. We don't have to go through the VPN. We don't have to go through these pe changing our passwords every, every you know, uh, 30 days. We don't have to go through that. And you can actually make the case that the more security you have, the less productive. There's a legitimate causality there. And sometimes the conversation ends right there. If we make people go through this, instead of them being able to do nine things an hour, they're going to be able, only be able to do seven things an hour. And I can't afford that reduction. Okay. Not to mention the, I don't want to bother doing that. It's a pain. I don't remember my password. That's why God invented post-it notes. You know. So if we add security, we're either going, we're going to be doing one of two things. We're either going to lower productivity or, going to, or we're going to be increasing price. And again, the analogy I use uh, is if, people, if the company is considered to be an apartment complex, everybody has two keys. You have a key to the outside building and you have a key to your own room, your own apartment. And if you're walking up and you take your outdoor key and everybody has that same key and you open the door and five feet behind you is someone you've never seen before in your life and is weighed down with bags do you let them in? If you let them in, congratulations, you've let the terrorists in. Well, they just pull a gun and go in anyway. Yo! <laughs> that makes it so much easier. You don't have to feel guilty about the decision. There you go. Okay. <laughs> and, and actually, that is, a, that is a challenge. That is a challenge, is do you, do you actually challenge the possible in incursion, because that is, that is an acceptable thing to do. That gets back into the whole social engineering. 
Someone calls, you don't know who, they're, who they are or whatever, and they identify themselves as we are support. We're, the, we're from Simplex IT. But we're from Simple Exit. Yeah, I wouldn't take it if I were you. You know, do you insist on additional identification? If you do, you're making everybody less productive. But you're being more secure. And part of the challenge from a corporate standpoint is the corporation has to decide what is their culture and what is their procedure, and we'll get into that in a minute, as far as dealing with those situations. Because in the, back, back at the apartment building, if you, if you let that person, keep that person locked out, you're a jerk. <coughs> Why don't you let the person in? They're obviously having trouble with the banks. You know, and there's, there's no blatantly right or wrong answer because it's dependent upon circumstances that you don't know at the moment. So it's up to the organization to decide what's the right answer, and then it's up to the culture of the organization to enforce that right answer and to educate it and make people realize that if you, were, you weren't really a jerk, you were being an appropriate, you know, uh, citizen. Like that French woman with her daughter. I mean, how do you think she feels about letting those terrorists into the building then went up and killed, you know, eight people? Yeah. I was in Vegas at Comdex uh, like three weeks after 9-11 whatever that was, um, and I was at a, a presentation, and someone got up and left, and they had a bag. And it was sitting like three feet from me, and the guy was absolutely proper, appropriate, and all that. I will tell you, there was a moment where I'm like, I'm cool. <laughs> I'm not worried about this or what is in there. You know? And like two minutes later, the guy came back, sat back down, he just went and got a drink. What do you think? The trick is getting your users to buy into it. Absolutely. But the start is to get the organization to buy into it. That's the big thing. So here's a self-assessment. Where are you? Danger zone. Any policies? Not really. We just kind of do things and there's no real training. And yeah, because we want you to get your work done, so yeah, you just got that iPad and your kid's been using it for months, and yeah, your, I, I saw your kid and they looked, yeah, so it's fine, it's fine. So, I mean, it's one of those, so you can see the danger zone. Really what we've got is, and, and you'll notice that a lot of this is employees are able to, and they don't necessarily know that they're not supposed to. Really, that's where a lot of core stuff comes from this guy. Halfway home. Yeah, we've got this policy, <laughs> yeah, uh, and it's, it's hidden. So we don't really talk about it much. You know, we may tell an employee, and usually it's an after the fact. Oh, you did that, you're not allowed to. Well, I didn't know that. Well, now you do, so don't do it again, you know. Uh, and yeah, we gotta scan the devices. There's a firewall, but we don't pay too much attention to it, so we've just got it running, kind of thing. And people, and again, We've got some tools in place, but we're not really using it to, to its fullest degree. Lockdown. Now, and here's one of the key, so we, yeah, so we actually do, and I do think that it can be done without too much difficulty just to have some common sense discussions with employees and to do that. But here's the other thing. Firewalls are not what they used to be. And this is something we are literally going through with our clients over the past couple of months, and we're just starting to. It used to be that a firewall was pretty much, we're going to block the traffic, whether it be types or source or destinations. But now a lot of them, Sophos has their own devices, SonicWalls or others, uh, Cisco's are like, they, they have additional, and often they, there's a fee associated with it, but they have additional layers of protection to basically uh, filtering, spamming, application behavior, all of that kind of fun stuff. And honestly, I'll be true, I'll be honest, uh, if you would have asked me a year, year and a half ago, I would say this isn't as critical. Not anymore. We've got it, and, and we're working on putting together a, a, a more core-based policy as far as how we're dealing with this stuff. Because we now think that this has to be, this, it, it's no longer an option. And, and also, and this is really a, a big one, employees know how to identify you know that that's not right. You know, if someone knocks on their front door and says, I'd like to clean your upstairs carpet for free, 
they're probably not going to go, come on in, let's do this. Some of the same common sense rules. Patching. There's really three types of patching in terms of this conversation. One is the OS, okay? And the idea of, oh, geez, patching, nine times out of ten, they don't work. So once, you know, every six months or so, I'll update the patch. No. And, and we, were, we, were much more, we were much more lax uh, with uh, patching uh, a year ago than we are now. Now, again, for a different level of uh, clients, we, we patch pretty much. Kevin, what do we do, a week or two weeks after they come out? Um, it's about a week and a half after Microsoft has their Patch Tuesday. Right. Uh, we pretty much let the rest of the world beta test them. <laughs> and then after things look good, like I said, week and a half-ish, um, we actually start pushing them to our customers. Right. So we do that now for workstations. We're going to be doing a similar thing for servers. Haven't quite got there yet. Uh, the 9 night, I think we've talked about that one <coughs> enough. This is equally important. And then the AV. You know, that still needs to be updated. It's, it's, not as, it's not as much of the flag bearer as it used to be, but it still needs to be updated. Now, here's another nice little topic on that. Your options to patch goes away in Windows 10. Okay? Haven't heard this officially yet, but I've heard it from enough sources that I don't think it's, I, I'm pretty sure it's going to be true, and that is that Windows 10 is not going to be an optional patch. The option will be whether you reboot. But it will, if it's online and there's patches available, your Windows 10 device will be patched and updated. Okay. Another thing, if you'll notice, uh, the Windows pre, or excuse me, the uh, uh, Word preview, Excel preview, there's no number. It's Word. It's not Word 2016, not Word 2015. It's Word. Yeah, I was just gonna, and you have to say Word. <laughs> Same thing for Excel and PowerPoint. One of the things that Microsoft is trying to do is they're trying to get away from this huge food chain of different versions of, of Word and Office and all of that kind of thing that's all over the bloody place. It's, you know, Word 2007, Word 2010, Word 2013, Word 2013 SP1, Word 2013 SP2 with these now, you know, no. You're just going to have the latest version. And is part of that the fact that I can't buy the license anymore, that I have to rent it? That's where they're going. You look at the same thing, Adobe's gone that way pretty much. Uh, so yeah, the, the idea that you're going to purchase licensing, no. They want it. And why? No, really, it's, it's revenue. Yeah, I mean, if you've got recurring, and honestly, we're on the same boat. We much prefer to have companies who use our services and who pay us less on a monthly uh, monthly basis, but over a longer period of time than somebody who just says, hey, come in and do this project. We'll do the project, absolutely. But we'd much rather have that long-term relationship. We think it's better for us. It's definitely how we're positioned. Um, and the, and the, other, the other issue is, is this kind of el eliminates Microsoft's need to have such a long history in terms of support. You know, we don't have, we, we're going to have a lot fewer folks who are going to be on older versions if they're automatically upgraded. So it's one of those things where the, the issue is, and I've been saying this, geez, for five years or so, the people who bought XP and Office 2003 and kept that for six years, and that was the only money they ever paid Microsoft, they are getting screwed. Okay? Because it's changing for them. Microsoft, however, would say, you know, they were using us for updates, they were using us for support, they were using us for this, and they only paid us one time. They got their money's worth and then some. And both parties are right. And, and the, bottom, the bottom line is, is it's, this is the way that they're going to go. Deal with it. I hate to say it, but yeah. So, when we talk about strategies, really we're going to go based on these four. Products, people, process, and policy. Products. Really, we're talking about, you know, firewalls. Are the products up to date? Now, here's the challenge, is that, to me, smaller companies, and, and this is something I'm trying to, I'm getting my head around, it's harder for a smaller company to basically say, I'm going to go to Best Buy and purchase X, Y, and Z and be able to answer these questions. Okay? There still has not been, and I include us in this, 
a one-size-fits-all, here's a box, turn that on, you're secure. It doesn't exist. And honestly, at this point, I'm not sure it's ever going to be. Security is a service. It is not a product. If you would have asked me two years ago, I probably would have said security is a product. You just got to make sure it's configured, blah, blah, blah. But I am now pretty much there with security as a service. All right. When you get into the products, the product, if you have it, the products, whatever they are and however they're configured, only on certain devices, then you have, by definition, unprotected devices. If I don't have something on this, and this is accessing the same data as this guy is, then I have an entryway. I have a way that a bad guy could take advantage of this device if it's not protected. Okay, so one of the things we can do on Sophos is we can make Sophos such that this, any data that comes out of this device is going to be secure and encrypted. No matter what I connect to, it'll go through what is essentially a VPN, if you will, through their servers and their services, even if I'm on the most unprotected, you know, maladjusted wireless network on the planet. People. Silent grain is made. Oh, anyway, there needs to be, if you're serious about this, there needs to be some kind of training. And, th and that training can be relatively casual with just some examples. It can be something that, and, and this is something we're looking to put together as a series of small, of, of short YouTubes, that we just say, hey, you should do this, here's some examples, all that kind of thing. Haven't gotten to that point yet, but... But really, how are, you, how are you going to make sure your people are doing what they're supposed to be doing or not? Risk assessment. Here's the problem. IT security is often viewed as an IT problem. It isn't. If you leave it up to IT, I guarantee you, you're not going to have an appropriate security, security situation. And the reason being is because they're the ones who are going to make the decision of how important it is for person X or person Y or person Z to be able to do whatever activities they need to be able to do remotely. And you may either be giving that person too much access or too little access. It is up to IT to implement, monitor, and manage whatever the strategy is. But it's up to business to at least understand and accept the assessment. And this is one of the challenges, I think. It's a big one. This is one of the challenges the companies have. This is, excuse me, this is one of the challenges that we have as ITs, ITs, folks, people, people-ish, rounding up, is we don't communicate this effectively. And usually management, they don't want to hear it anyway. Because all they hear is, okay, we have to spend money, right? Because you, you want us to buy something. Great. So what is it now? New box? New piece of software? You're going to get a t-shirt out of this, aren't you? How do we assess the technology? Do we test it at all? And this is one where, have the costs been calculated for breaches, including reputa reputation costs? This is one where, where vendors, we love to use this. We'll love to come up with this nice little calculation that'll show if you don't do this, oh, if this happened, oh, I'd hate to be your dog because your dog would die. You know, it, it, it's very difficult. One of the main calculations I try to get customers to have is um, if you had an hour of outage, what's the cost? That's a tough that is a tough conversation to have with customers because, well, I don't know. Uh, and usually it's if they're already pre, you know, if, if they're already kind of leaning on, on being nervous, then they're going to give you a higher number. And if they really don't care, they're going to give you a lower number and whatever. But what steps are taken? In the, case, in the event of a breach, what even constitutes a breach? How do you know if a breach happens? These are the conversations that need to happen. Business continuity disaster recovery plan. Every IT problem, the last solution is your backup. 
I don't care what the IT problem is, your last solution of that problem is going to your backups. If you do not know that your backups are good, you do not have good backups. You need to test them. And not just once. The costs for having some kind of business continuity disaster recovery plan is minimal enough, relatively speaking, that even a smaller company should be able to say, well, if we lost this functionality, here's how we'd handle it. Here's what we'd do. Because as I've said several times before, the worst time to learn CPR is when someone's having a heart attack. You know, and the worst time to put together a disaster recovery or business continuity response is in the middle of that issue. You don't have to, and, and I've, I've been through it where we've actually done you know, scripts and calling lists and all that. Honestly, I don't think those are appropriate for small or medium companies. But at least having a general idea of if this is out, here's what, just some general baseline concepts of what your actions would be. I think those are appropriate and I don't think they're expensive. Policy. So this is where you talk about whether there's buy-in and with people and all that kind of thing. So who should decide it? Okay, and whoever, whoever's deciding it, is there a champion of some kind or another, someone who will say, no, this is serious, we mean it, so that it actually has some weight to it? If not, we got a problem. How do we communicate the policy? If no one's been told, that's a bit of a challenge. How do we verify that people are actually following it? Carrot stick, carrot stick. The thing is, you get people buy into it, they'll enforce it stronger than you. Or we'll hunt them down and kill I mean, yes, yes, you're right. They'll rat out the people that don't. Especially you give them awards for ratting them out. That's always fun. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh dear. <laughs> and what are the rewards for reporting policy violations? Yeah, and this is really test, test, test. And, and, and when I say that, there should be some level of encryption to the backups, minimal access. And what I mean by that is because, for example, in, in the, um, uh, the ransomware, the ransomware goes out and encrypts files it can access based on what that user has rights to. So you don't want users having rights to backups because that could actually, that could actually go and encrypt your backups, which is not a good thing. Uh, and you want a, some level of copies off your network because no matter what, there are vulnerabilities that can touch. So if somebody s says, yes, I've got my backups, my backups are on the same subnet or even on a different subnet, but there's connection and there's communication going on, that's great. But as long as there's some communication that's going on that's somewhat open and available, there is some level of vulnerability. However, that is managed, and you may be willing to take a bigger risk, so I'm going to have all my daily backups and hourly backups to this device, and then once a week, I'm going to take this stuff and take it off-site. As long as you recognize, in my opinion, you have a up to one week vulnerability, that's highly unlikely but it is a vulnerability. As long as management sees that, I'm okay. But you need to have that conversation. So, short story long, I think that's pretty much, I, I end with good backups because I think that's, any questions or anything that we've covered? Has this been useful? Very. Okay. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yay. Thank you.